move in our ongoing display of the agenda of the Libby Committee inquiry on the electronic mass surveillance on EU citizens. You have known that we had a plan today consisting of three sessions, namely, number one, a presentation by Professor Stephen Pierce, law professor at the University of Essex, United Kingdom, on national intelligence activities in the light of EU primary law, but I'm sure you know that he hasn't been able to make it. So he won't be here today, and we won't be having either session three, which is to be postponed, namely the presentation of the working document by the shadow rapporteurs. Mr. Moraes and Mrs. Infield, they will be having their they will be having their presentation in, a, in, a, in, a, in another, in a further occasion. So we are concentrating here today on the, uh, on the uh, point, uh, the session second, which is the presentation on court cases and other complaints on national surveillance programs, part second. Just let me, let me tell you that uh, as to the language profile of this meeting, unfortunately, because of the conditions of the room available, not all the languages will be, will be at your disposal. There will be no Danish, I'm sorry about that, nor Finnish, not Latvian, not Maltese, nor Croatian available. Sorry, sorry to, to announce that none of the languages are available in this particular session. But having said this, we should be proceeding to the presentation by our guest this evening, Dr. Adam Botnar, to whom we warmly welcome. He's the Vice President of the Board, Helsinki Foundation for Human Rights, Poland. We will be hearing his presentation. He's here before our committee at the request that this organization, along with another Polish NGOs, have submitted to different state agencies and institutions with view to the disclosure of public information and the responses they have received so far. Then, after his presentation, we will be having some room for discussion, questions and answers, and uh, I suggest first the floor goes to the rapporteur and shadow rapporteurs and then to the other members, members willing to intervene. So, first floor, to Mr. Botnar here. The floor is yours. Uh, uh, dear Mr. Chairman, dear members of the committee, ladies and gentlemen, um, on behalf of the Polish Helsinki Foundation for Human Rights uh, and the Panopticon Foundation, I would like to Thank you for inviting me to this session of the Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs Committee of the European Parliament. I would like to underline that all views uh, shared today were prepared in connection with Mrs. Katarzyna Szymielewicz of the Panopticon Foundation, uh, and basically I speak on behalf of uh, two organizations. Uh, we are very grateful for the interest of the LIBE Committee in Developments in Poland regarding the PRISM affair as well as the reaction of Polish NGOs to this affair. Um, I would like to start with that uh, our organizations, together with the Polish section of the Amnesty International, were quite surprised with the lack of proper reaction by the Polish authorities, Polish government, and politicians to the prison, and other disclosures made by Edward Snowden. Uh, we didn't have any serious debate uh, what those disclosures mean for the mean for the rights of Polish uh, citizens and whether constitutional right to privacy is sufficiently protected in the Polish territory. There were also no parliamentary debate uh, debate on this issue, uh, as opposed to, to Germany, for example. Therefore, uh, after vacation period, we decided to organize a conference devoted specifically to this issue. Uh, the conference was organized on 11th September 2013. We invited all major politicians, 
including prime minister, minister uh, ministers related to the security uh, forces. Um, but unfortunately, neither prime minister nor, nor ministers relevant for those issues accepted our invitation. So basically, they didn't want to listen to uh, views or comments by NGOs or to questions asked by them. The only minister which accepted our invitation was minister responsible for administration and digitalization, Mr. Michał uh, Boni. Um, and uh, one of the most important things during this debate was that he declared that, he will, that uh, the position of the Polish government uh, will be to bring to the attention of Vivian Reding that the issue of privacy should be and protection of personal data should be subject of uh, negotiations concerning transatlantic trade and investment agreement. Um, this debate was attended by uh, politicians affiliated with uh, human rights committees of two chambers of the Polish parliament. They declared willingness to organize sessions uh, of the relevant committees of the parliament devoted to PRISM, but unfortunately such sessions were not organized until today. Uh, I think that uh, the only direct consequence of this debate was the motion submitted by the Ombudsman to the Polish Prosecutor's Office in which he, uh, she uh, asked the Prosecutor's Office to start the uh, investigation regarding uh, PRISM affair. But uh, until now there is no answer to this letter. But we didn't want to stop w just with making a debate. Uh, during the, our debate we declared that as a follow-up, we'll try to submit a number of freedom of information requests to, Polish, uh, to different Polish uh, authorities regarding PRISM, as well as a reaction to other disclosures or relevant uh, issues. And uh, just one month later, uh, in the middle of October 2013, we've submitted uh, altogether 100 questions uh, with the use of freedom of information law but uh, to different state uh, institutions, such as Prime Minister, Chancellor of President, uh, Minister of Justice, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of Interior, uh, Secret Services, Prosecutor General, Parliamentary Committee, uh, Office for Electronic Communication, Privacy Commissioner, or Ombudsman. And those issues, uh, altogether there were in fact 362 questions, but basically some of them overlapped and they were directed to uh, similia uh, to, to, to different institutions. And basically we asked about specific issues, such as what was the knowledge and awareness of the PRISM um, at the moment of disclosure, what is the level of cooperation on this between Polish and U.S. secret services, what were the contacts with the U.S. administration since disclosures made by Mr. Snowden, uh, what is the protection of Polish citizens against potential abuses, procedures applied, verification of compliance with domestic law, what was the reaction of parliamentary committees to uh, lack of activity in this field of the government. Uh, we asked about different technical aspects, for example, such as whether secret services have access or they use the X-key score uh, application. We also asked, because we thought that it is also relevant to this issue, what was the procedure of dealing with Mr. Snowden's request for visa in Poland. Uh, suddenly, uh, taking into account a shortage of time, it is difficult to make a summary of all 100 questions. I think we, we don't have time for this. But, uh, but I would like to, to underline that we took into account following factors. Uh, first of all, uh, we, when drafting those questions and asking them, we took into account our previous experience in dealing with freedom of information laws, including our litigation experience. And for example, uh, in past we litigated quite successfully um, cases concerning access to statistical data on wiretapping in Poland. We also obtained um, crucial information with the use of freedom of infor information law of certain aspects related to the CIA rendition program. Uh, second, uh, we took into account the activities of German NGOs and German academia regarding this and also some similar questions which were posed to the German government regarding this. Uh, we took into account the limited applic applicability of the freedom of information law. We are quite aware 
that we can ask, ask only for a very specific information. Um, and we are aware of certain restrictions that stem from the national security issues. So, for example, we believe that we can ask whether there is any agreement between Secret Services and uh, US, secret, Polish Secret Services and the US <laughs> Secret Services, but obviously we are aware that we cannot ask about the content of this agreement with the use of this freedom of information law. And furthermore, we, are, we were aware of the division of competences between different state institutions, but in this particular case, uh, some of our questions overlapped because we are not um, ready to, to determine uh, in this particular moment which institution was responsible for a given aspect of this. We are aware, and we, have, uh, we are aware from the very beginning, that some state institutions would not answer to our questions at all, uh, or that they, they will try to prolong answering to those uh, questions. Uh, we are prepared for this because uh, we have experience in litigation of cases before administrative courts. So, for example, when we are litigating cases concerning access to statistical data on wiretapping, it took us two or three years to get this data finally, but we, but we did it. And, and we think that it might be the case, uh, it might be a similar case with some of the questions we asked with the use of freedom of information law. Um, we also think that our questions uh, should be an inspiration for journalists. So we try to promote them in order to push journalists to ask similar questions to the, to the government. So, so to a certain extent, we, we try to do uh, proper research regarding what kind of questions could be asked, and in order to inspire a Polish journalists to ask those questions. And I think... Um, this initial lack of response by Polish politicians was uh, quite commented in media during the recent visit of the U.S. State Secretary John Kerry in Poland. Um, as of now, as of 18th November 2013, we have received initial answers from some state institutions. Um, some of them provided us with quite comprehensive answers regarding their activities up to now. Uh, so, for example, privacy commissioner uh, informed us like this, but some of them responded only partially, uh, and those answers were of general nature or confirmed state of affairs that was quite predictable. So, for example, the um, uh, Secret Services Committee of the Polish uh, Lower Chamber of Parliament, of Polish Sejm, confirmed that there was, no, there was neither meeting nor even motion by individual member to organize a meeting to discuss prison. Uh, some state institutions declared that they want prolongation of a term to respond until mid-December. So by virtue of law, they have such a right to, to claim such a prolongation because of the complexity of questions. Um, and, for example, Prime Minister uh, gave such an initial answer and the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Um, and we also received some answers from the Secret Services, um, and so some of them answered that because of national security they will not answer any question whatsoever. Uh, which means that we will have to ask once again and, and then maybe to, uh, to go for uh, litigation. But we are also quite surprised by some of the answers that, were, that have been already received by us. So, um, first of all, most of the institutions declared that they had knowledge on the prism from media. And such declaration was made inter alia by the Minister of Justice. But, for example, the uh, Agency for Internal Security declared that they had knowledge on PRISM from so-called open sources, so, uh, which, uh, which is quite, uh, I think, interesting. Second, uh, we obtained information that the Minister of Justice had a meeting in August 2013 with the U.S. Ambassador to Poland. But, interestingly, during this meeting, the issue of PRISM was not raised at all. Uh, we also obtained information that a PRISM was subject of discussion during the meeting of the Council of the European Union devoted to just and home affairs that took place on 7th October 2013. But we didn't, uh, uh, we don't know conclusions of this meeting because we were informed that, that formal minutes have not been prepared. Uh, we, also, uh, we are also informed that during this meeting of 7th October 2013, Polish authorities signaled 
that explanation of the PRISM and other programs of massive uh, surveillance is necessary, but it should not influence binding treaties with the US, such as uh, Passenger Name Records Treaty or the SWIFT Agreement. And finally, we, obtained, we also obtained information that none of the Parliamentary Committee declares willingness to organize a session devoted to PRISM. So, at the moment, we wait for further answers and extended transparency of Polish authorities. We hope for a certain level of their political accountability for negligence to react to Snowden's disclosures. As citizens, we believe we have the right to know what the state is doing in order to protect, uh, to protect our privacy. Unfortunately, in Poland, this issue is not subject of political divisions. Majority of, majority of politicians tend to accept the existing status quo. Therefore, we believe that NGOs have a special role to play here with the use of the only instrument which we have in our hands, which is the freedom of information law. We also think that uh, taking into account our previous experience with the CIA rendition program, that the use of the freedom of information laws may be of help to investigative committees established at the European level. But um, as you can see, you know, it takes time and, and basically will not stop with our effort in claiming those, uh, this uh, data. And sooner or later, we hope to collect more than we have right now. Thank you very much. We thank you. We thank you so much, Mr. Bogner. And now, as we said, we should be opening floor first for the uh, Rapporteur, shadow rapporteurs, first floor. Thus goes to our rapporteur, Mr. Moraes. So, thank you very yes. much uh, to Dr. Bodnar for coming, and I'm sorry that you were taking the whole. Thank you to Dr. Bodnar for your for coming today. I'm sorry that you're having to take the whole session on your shoulders. Uh, Professor Piers uh, was not able to come at the last minute. And, uh, but I found what you said ex very informative. I was a member of the uh, CIA renditions inquiry. And um, as you know, as you alluded to just now, there was a, a very big part of that um, focused on the NGOs in Poland. And again, the Freedom of Information um, Act that you used was very useful to us. And of course, the ramifications of that are coming up just even this week when um, you have, I think you have a, a case um, already this week on, on renditions. Can I ask then this question? You talked about two, two, two questions. You talked about the status quo in, uh, in Poland. Um, one of the things that the inquiry is looking at is um, our oversight mechanisms in each member state. We've looked at a number of individual member states now. Um, last week, I think Denmark, Sweden, and so on. Um, do you think, first of all, just give us a general answer on whether you think the oversight mechanisms in Poland are adequate? We've asked the uh, parliamentary oversight parliamentarians to come, um, and we've not had a response. So give us, as you, you mentioned your role as NGOs in Poland, uh, given that status quo, just give me a snapshot of what you think. Secondly, um, the way that you've used the Freedom of Information Act, we saw that with the CIA rendition inquiry as being very effective. Uh, do you think you're going to get more information um, about what role perhaps there was um, with Poland and with the United States? Um, can you give us a bit more detail about that, whether you said it would take time? Uh, do you think in time documents will come forward? Is that something that parliamentarians in Poland um, are concerned about? Do they feel that pressure? Or is it something that they're, they're unafraid of? Um, give, give us some sense of, of what's happening. What's the culture like in Poland? I mean, is this a new story? Are people particularly concerned? Or culturally, is this not a story at all? Because it's quite interesting to see the different, um, the different uh, analysis we're getting from parliamentarians from various countries at this stage of the inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Moraes, for setting your questions and an example, because I'm sure you all have in mind that this is a hearing, so we should be concentrating on questions so that there will be round for answers. The way we proceed usually in this kind of sessions is that you take individually 
the questions and answers by the rapporteurs or the shadow rapporteurs, and then we open a second round for members which are willing to make some additional points. But first, individually, you're going to be answering rapporteur and then one by one shadow rapporteurs. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for very interesting uh, questions. In, in fact, you know, I was once uh, attending LIBE committee, and it was in the context of the CIA rendition uh, um, over one year ago. Um, and um, I think that, that here, you know, we can see something like, like a similar story, I would say, that when it comes to the U.S.-Poland um, relationship, uh, politicians tend to be quite silent uh, on this uh, issue. Because when we uh, look into the story of the CIA rendition, we can see that the parliamentary oversight over secret services didn't work, really, because there was only one hearing of the uh, mm, uh, Secret Services Supervising Committee organized at that time. Um, and basically, after this meeting, as far as I know, they, they decided not to follow up the issue. Here, in this particular case, we received the answer that the same uh, uh, Secret Services Committee uh, didn't organize any meeting whatsoever on this issue, on PRISM issue, nor there was no even a motion by the individual me member to organize this meeting. Uh, but I would like to, uh, because of course when we think about the parliamentary oversight, it is not just this specific committee which can work in secret uh, which has uh, full conf confidentiality guarantee, but we have also other committees. So one of them is the uh, Human Rights and Justice Committee in the lower chamber of parliament in Sejm. Um, and I know that one of the members of this committee, Mr. Richard Kalisz, has made a formal motion to organize a meeting devoted just to prison. But this motion has been submitted uh, two months ago, and until now there was no uh, meeting, and it seems there will be no. Uh, second, uh, uh, during the debate, uh, which was organized by us uh, on 11th September 2013, uh, Mr. Josef Pinor, so the former member of the European Parliament, has also declared uh, that he will uh, call his own committee in the Senate, in the Second Chamber of Parliament, to organize a meeting devoted to PRISM, but I don't know whether he submitted finally an motion or, uh, or not. So, 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 in general, there was no parliamentary oversight in this particular, in this particular um, case, despite the pressure by NGO interest uh, of media in this, uh, in this issue. So, um, so if I would if I can comment, I, I think that in this particular sense, when it comes to uh, specific rights of uh, citizens and, and, and one of the major violations of human rights, we, we didn't see a parliament to react uh, properly on this, um, on this issue. Um, when it comes to the, to the question relating what we can obtain, uh, I think that uh, all our questions, these 100 questions, were, quite, very, were very, very specific. So uh, we ask about such things that, we, uh, that could be answered yes or no, or that could be answered even with a, with a single sentence. Um, but uh, but basic, uh, and uh, the, the most important questions were, were asked uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, Prime Minister, uh, Ministry of Interior. But basically, they didn't respond it yet, and they have time un under the law. So, so, so we have to wait until uh, mid-December 2013. And I think that, like, taking into account my, my previous experience with the, with the CIA rendition, uh, it's like, you know, collecting puzzles. So you collect one information from, uh, uh, from your country, you collect some other information from some other country, you collect some information from, uh, from certain disclosures that, that, that happen, and all of this creates a certain, uh, certain picture. Uh, it is the reason why the, uh, the case of Mr. Al-Nasiri and Abu Zubaida are right now pending before the European Court of Human Rights, because I would say Polish elements were just a small puzzles in the whole, in the whole picture of this, uh, of this situation. Uh, with respect to the, uh, to the question relating to the general atmosphere, 
I think that some, some Polish media are interested uh, in the issue. Uh, some politicians, but rather individual ones, are interested. But, but I would say that, uh, that this issue is not subject of political division. So there is like a general acceptance that, okay, so let's better be silent, let's better not touch it. You know, these are rules which uh, the secret ser services work. Uh, and basically, it is, maybe it is, not our, uh, it is not our problem. So, so to a certain extent, it is similar to, this, to the CIA rendition. So I remember, when the, for example, when the European Parliament was investigating the case, uh, there was no interest whatsoever in, in, uh, by Polish politicians, except for some individualities, to, to cooperate even on, on the explanation of this issue. So that's why we think that we have, to, we have a special role to perform here, I mean NGOs, because we can ask questions, basically, we can uh, make those questions visible and we can try to convince uh, Polish society that those issues are important for, the, uh, for, their, um, um, for their security and for their rights. There is, uh, I would say that the, the exceptions, uh, uh, if I would compare CIA rendition and, and, and uh, PRISM, I think the exception is that, there are, that even right now in the government there are some ministers who are interested in this issue, and I mentioned here the name of Mr. Michał Boni. He was also quite engaged in the European Parliament in negotiations concerning the data protection uh, regulation. But, but basically, uh, in fact, he's the only one who is uh, able to speak loud on those issues. Uh, but still, the, the ministry which he is responsible for does not control the whole thing. Uh, he is responsible just for the small, small part of it, so it does, he does not have influence on the policy of the, of the whole uh, government. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now we move to the uh, rapport, uh, shadow rapporteurs on their order. First floor goes to Mr. Foss. Yeah. <clears throat> vielen Dank, uh, Vorsitzender, und vielen Dank auch Herr Botner. <laughs> Der richtige Kanal, weiß ich nicht. Ja? Prima. Ähm, also vielen Dank Ihnen auch ähm, für die Erläuterungen. Ich habe verschiedene kleine Fragen, auch im Anschluss an das, was Herr Moraes eben gesagt hat, hinsichtlich der Ängste oder, oder der öffentlichen Stimmung. Ähm, gibt es Ängste in der Bevölkerung und gibt es in diesem Zusammenhang auch eine öffentliche Diskussion darüber zwischen was die richtige Balance ist zwischen Sicherheit und Privatsphäre, ähm, dann wie können Sie sich erklären, warum eigentlich das parlamentarische Gremium oder das polnische Parlament in dem Fall ähm, ein, ein so mittlerweile Desinteresse ja anscheinend möglicherweise hat an diesem Thema, ähm, wie es dazu vielleicht kommen könnte. Eine weitere Frage Haben Sie Erkenntnisse darüber? Sie hatten zwar Deutschland erwähnt, aber haben Sie auch irgendwelche Rückmeldungen aus anderen Ländern der Mitgliedstaaten? Und Sie sprachen davon, eine letzte Frage hinsichtlich der Position der polnischen Regierung zu diesem ganzen Thema, dass man dort gesagt hat, ja, im Rahmen der Verhandlungen von TTIP heißt das jetzt vielleicht, ich weiß nicht, ob Sie das deuten können, aber ich wollte zumindest mal nachfragen, ob das mehr als eine Art inhaltliche ähm, Bedingung oder, oder inhaltlich von TTIP gemeint war oder ob das mehr äh, gemeint ist, dass man sagt, ja, man sollte TTIP weiter verhandeln, aber bevor wir das abschließen, müssen wir zum Datenschutz eine Regelung finden. Vielen Dank, Mr. Bodnar. Back to you. Okay. So uh, I would say that uh, when you look into the NGO sector, and uh, I would say to, to Warsaw circles, uh, people are quite concerned with what, uh, what happened to, uh, to, Mr., uh, to Mr. Snowden, and uh, people are concerned about disclosures which were, which were made by him. Uh, but I wouldn't say that the concern in Warsaw uh, among academia and NGO circles translate uh, on the general atmosphere in the, in the society. Uh, 
I wouldn't say so. I, I, mm, I observe the German, German debate, and we cannot we cannot say that we have a that we have similar uh, approach uh, uh, here. That people um, understand the uh, the problem. Um, furthermore, uh, we have also some. Uh, our own problems with uh, wiretapping surveillance and abuse of powers by, by secret services, and those issues are not even yet resolved. So, so there is a case pending before the Constitutional Court, but I don't see like a massive outreach, massive protest by Polish citizens that yes, we should do uh, something with, uh, with, with it. it. It comes like with waves, so that media are interested for a couple of days, there, is, there are some declarations by, by politicians, so there is something like a, um, so, so they are able to, to, to control the, the public debate for a certain moment, but then everything comes back to, to reality. Uh, and so, so just, just to give you a, an idea, uh, which is completely like different issue, but it shows the attitude. Until today, we do not have a single regulation on the use of CCTV cameras in public places. We do not have a law regarding this. And, and there is no pressure by, by people that we should have such a law. NGOs pressure for this, but not general population as, uh, uh, as such. So if I would uh, uh, say that uh, what takes uh, prevalence, whether it is security or privacy, it's rather security. Uh, in, the, in the Polish context. Um, and I think th it is the, the consequence why the parliament has so uh, little interest in the issue. Because if it is just the issue which is raised by NGOs, which are concerned uh, and which try to understand the consequences of this approach, uh, but it is not a part of the general popular mobilization, then politicians do not have a uh, need to, to follow uh, this issue. And uh, please note that uh, we had this uh, situation when politicians really reacted to such issues, which was ACTA agreement, uh, anti-counterfeiting uh, trade agreement. So Poland was uh, the leading country in terms of making protests on streets. But at that time, it was about something different. It was not about privacy, but the general argument was that the government uh, is intruding uh, into our internet freedom. And it seems that internet freedom as such was a higher value than privacy is, is uh, right, uh, right now. So, so, uh, so uh, you cannot expect such tension because of PRISM uh, as, it, as compared to, to tension that was created as a result of uh, as a result of ACTA. And uh, as regards uh, tra transatlantic trade investment um, uh, agreement, um, uh, I think for us uh, it, is, uh, it, seems, uh, it seems that for us it is one of the very, very few things we can uh, um, take certain accountability uh, on government because we have this declaration by Mr. Boni, which was made during our debate, that he will present issue of data protection and uh, mass surveillance um, as preconditions for, of, uh, as Polish preconditions for EU entering into the TTIP. Um, and, uh, and we know that as a follow-up to our, uh, our meeting, he presented this. So Mr. Boni, he's trying to, to be in a contact and try to, he tries to be responsible to stakeholders. And he's uh, responsible on the part of government to enter into this. But the question is how long it will last. For sure, if the government will try to change the position here, uh, so uh, if the government will try to change a position on the data protection, uh, in the context of TTIP, then uh, we will we'll try to create some, some pressure in, in media that basically the government is not following what it has declared uh, uh, before. So, so I, I, I would say that in this context, uh, uh, we will try to control government. Thank you. Okay, now to share the rapporteur, Mrs. Indveld.
Yes, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mr. Botnar, for your uh, for your interesting presentations and for your for your efforts uh, in particular. Um, I have a couple of questions um, to you and some more general questions. Uh, the first question: Do you plan to work together with organisations uh, in other countries? Uh, in litigating and submitting national, let's say, freedom of information requests in parallel, um, in, in a kind of, um, you know, joining forces, if you want. My second question, um, have you by any chance submitted any requests for information relating to INSEN, the uh, European um, Intelligence Sharing Centre? I can tell by the look on your face that you haven't. <laughs> Um, my third question to you, uh, and by extension also to um, people in other countries, do Polish politicians realize that they themselves may be the target of surveillance and that information about them may be stored by other, you know, by third country governments or indeed their own government? And do journalists and lawyers realize that their communications with their sources and clients respectively um, cannot be trusted to be fully confidential. My last question, uh, Chair, if you'll allow me, is not actually a question to Mr. Botnar, but a question to the Council and the Commission. Uh, you, Mr. Botnar mentioned um, a, a debate um, by the GHA Council on the 7th of October, um, and I asked around. Apparently the matter was discussed over lunch, so it's not mentioned in the minutes. Uh, and this is, of course, a classic trick to hide from the public um, what has been discussed. And I think in this particular instance, people have a right to know. This cannot possibly be confidential information that affects national security. Um, ministers of Justice and Home Affairs <laughs> discussing uh, the eavesdropping scandal of the NSA over lunch hiding it from their citizens. I think that's outrageous. I understand, and I don't know if this information is correct, that Commissioner Redding was present at that meeting and was actually getting quite worked up about the whole thing. I would like to ask the people of the Council present here and the people of the Commission, if we can please get a written and public report of that debate, and if they feel they cannot answer that question, can I ask um, if the chair of this committee, Mr. Lopez, is willing to write to the Commission and the Council and ask them officially for a written report of the debate that took place on the 7th of October um, on PRISM? Thank you. We're taking note of your request, as usual. Chair, I think that we should first try if the people of the Council and the Commission present here feel that they can answer this request. <coughs> Are you suggesting that the Commission goes first before the round of answers for Mr. Bodnar? I would, you're, I would, you're the chair. You decide. <laughs> I, I, would say, I would say Mr. Bodnar. Okay. Mr. Bodnar. Okay. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much. As regards uh, first questions, uh, you know, it was to a great extent our intent uh, to, uh, to make this uh, request for public information, and that's why we we published with Mrs. Katarzyna Szymilewicz this article in Guardian, uh, which is in your, in your um, papers, uh, in order to show that it is one of the strategies that could be followed, that, that some other NGOs may try to do uh, certain, uh, certain things regarding this. Um, we didn't yet start any, any formal work li like this, but I, I take this idea and then maybe we should, we should come back and especially when we'll be in, in this moment of getting more and more answers, uh, we'll be able to convince our uh, colleagues from, from other organizations to do similar work. And uh, basically uh, we have working cooperation with a num with number of NGOs in different countries. So, so, for example, my organization is in a good relationship with different Helsinki committees that have similar potential to do similar work. But the only problem I see is uh, capacity uh, of, to do a follow-up. Because uh, in, we are, as, uh, and I would like to underline here, that we are prepared that we, even with uh, tens of questions which are not answered, we are ready to go to courts. 
but not all organizations which are existing in other member states have similar capacity or experience. So, so, and I think it is quite detrimental when the NGO is making a request and then is stopping, stopping in the middle. Uh, it may bring also certain damage to the reputation of such, such NGOs. So it, is, so it is not such a, in my opinion, easy, uh, easy task to do just to, to say to other NGOs, please do it like this. Uh, they should have capacity to do, to do this uh, properly. But, but of course we'll consider it especially with the cooperation with Helsinki committees. With respect to the second questions, we submitted uh, motions only to the Polish uh, authorities, so, uh, so no European level uh, institutions. I don't know whether I've, I've understood your, your question correctly, but we asked also Polish secret services, different kind of, uh, so uh, agency for intelligence, agency for internal security, agency for military intelligence, for counter uh, military intelligence, uh, Central Anti-Corruption Office, so, so all uh, intelligence services, but only Polish ones. Okay. Will you allow me for one second, uh, Chair? Yes. Just for, I, I, as, a, as a suggestion, I mean, INSEN is supposed to be uh, a cooperation between national secret services, but it seems to escape any kind of democratic scrutiny because we cannot scrutinize them, but you're basically also saying the same. It might be interesting to ask a question about the Polish input or the Polish role, whatever, in INSEN. Thank, thank you very much. And, uh, and, the, and the third question is, uh, you know, we didn't have a, uh, whether Polish politicians realize that they can be subject of surveillance. So we didn't have a disclosure of similar type as uh, Germany had. So, uh, so I think that they could be aware of this, but we didn't have a real example of, uh, of, of this. But I would like to underline that some of our questions concerned just this. So what, for example, the Agency of Intelligence or Agency for Internal Security did in order to protect security of Polish politicians and their uh, communication? So, uh, so what was basically uh, the, the reaction uh, after Snowden's uh, disclosures, but we don't have answers to this yet. Uh, as regards lawyers uh, or journalists, I think they are, um, you know, we had this debate uh, in the context of operation of the Polish uh, secret services. And we, had some, and we had some cases of some journalists, uh, for example, whose uh, uh, billing information was checked by secret services. Uh, we even uh, supported one journalist in a case which ended up with a, with a success. Uh, so the head of the Central Anti-Corruption Office had to apologize for unlawful check of billing information of such journalists. But, but when I analyze the public debate, they are more concerned with the operation of Polish services uh, than with general massive surveillance programs uh, made by the U.S. Okay, now let's hear from the Commission and the Council as to the question that was posed by Mrs. Infel here about the Reading meeting, October the 7th. Please, the Commission. Yes, good evening. Titus Poenar from DG Justice. We are not in a position to give a response now, but we will pass on the request to Vice President Reading. From the Council, would like to say a word? <coughs> Okay, point taken, note. We understand there is a commitment to provide an answer from the Commission as to the meeting that was mentioned. Mrs. Enville, would you like to come? Well, yes, Chair, I would then like to ask that on behalf of this committee you ask the Commission, oh, sorry, the Council uh, officially for a written report on the discussions that took place on PRISM on uh, October 7th. Okay. Okay. We take note. We'll, we will proceed to gather further information as to this, as to this point. And we should be moving now from, from, from Mrs. Inveld as Shadow Rapporteur to Mr. Albrecht. You the following, please. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you also to Mr. Bodnar to be here and uh, to lay out uh, your 
views and experience that's um, also dealing with these in cases and individual approaches by, by the NGOs. Um, I mean, what I'm mostly interested at the moment uh, would be the question, how do you feel, I mean, you, you mentioned a bit how it was in the same, but how do you feel generally the approach by national parliaments to scrutiny uh, is taking place and do you think that there's an opportunity for NGOs at the moment to enter uh, that parliamentary scrutiny on intelligence uh, work or a general debate because my impression is that there's not much happening in national parliaments at the moment um, and the question is uh, if that could be changed if there is an approach by governments and national parliaments to also address the problem of safeguards in the area of national security, in your view. And um, linked to that, the question, if you think that safeguards, fundamental rights and human rights safeguards are properly addressed by the member states in the area of national security today and if there is uh, also um, properly the possibility for redress um, for citizens with regard to the, those infringements on the level of member states. Thank you Mr. Albrecht. The floor is yours, Mr. Bodnar. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very difficult question, and I know that, that you were in Poland uh, recently uh, participating in, 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 in conferences uh, regarding this. Um, you know, uh, our approach is that we use every possible opportunity which exists in the context of, of Parliament. Obviously, um, it is impossible for us to enter or somehow to be active at the level of the parliamentary committee responsible for secret services because its proceedings are secret uh, uh, so, and, and they do not have a practice of inviting particular members we can, uh, uh, to, to invite uh, external experts or, uh, or NGOs. Uh, the only thing we can do is just to make a general call that maybe they should start be concerned about, uh, about this. Uh, we have some opportunities regarding uh, committees dealing with human rights or dealing with, uh, with foreign affairs. So, for example, uh, uh, for example, I know that in a couple of days there will be a hearing in the Foreign Affairs Committee devoted to the visit of John Kerry to Poland. So I think maybe it is the, the opportunity when... Uh, NGOs or uh, some politicians may ask some specific questions to this uh, r related to this visit, why some issues were taken or some other issues were not taken. And especially uh, what is positive is that there are still some members of parliament who are concerned. So they can ask questions and they are members of this, of this committee and, uh, and um, as a consequence they may bring this, those issues to certain public attention. Uh, we have also, uh, there are also possibilities for uh, mm, making interpolations or questions, official questions by members of the parliament. So we hope that if some of our questions are not answered in due course by uh, relevant ministers, maybe some of the members of the parliament will take them and will ask them in this, in this parliamentary fashion and maybe it will produce some uh, some change so so uh, and and in fact these are the, the uh, so our general opportunities uh, is just to present this issue and just to convince politicians that it is important and to rely on the fact that some of them are concerned uh, and some of them even if they are in a very small minority still they can uh, they can proceed with uh, with this um, I am aware that, uh, that some of the NGO leaders have already started discussion that this issue should be subject of uh, 
discussion in the context of upcoming European Parliament elections. So, and, uh, and I think uh, it could be, for NGOs, it is much easier uh, to create something like a questionnaire or some debates with the candidates for the European Parliament uh, elections in this context, you know, so what you are going to do in the context of privacy. So, so I think that uh, one, one of the points of our agenda as, as NGOs would be to put privacy as the issue in the context of the European Parliament elections, and I think it is the opportunity for some other, uh, for some other um, uh, NGOs in other member, uh, in, uh, other member, uh, member states. Uh, when it comes to, to safeguards, you know, in my, my feeling is that they exist uh, in general on paper, but in practice when it comes to real problems, it seems that they do not work. So uh, I mean here especially the special oversight parliamentary, parliamentary committee. But even, uh, for example, one of the issues which is discussed uh, in last years is the creation of an additional body, uh, which would be a Mm, a group of independent experts, uh, most probably former judges of the Constitutional Court or the Supreme Court, whose task would be to supervise secret services. So basically to, to, uh, to replicate to a certain extent the German model. Uh, because uh, right now we do not have such independent oversight uh, mechanism. And I don't mean here a mechanism that would be in the parliament, but basically outside of the structure of, of parliament. But, the debate works like this, that Ministry uh, of Interior is presenting this idea. Uh, it is subject of discussion for a couple of weeks, let's say, in, in media, and then for half a year, one year, nothing happens, okay? And then they come back once again, and, and basically, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not really sure whether there is a real willingness to do anything uh, that would bring more control over secret services in this term of Parliament and the term will end in two years. And right now, you know, we didn't see even a draft law that would create, uh, that would provide for creation of this uh, special supervising mechanism over secret services. Thank you. Mr. Albrecht, would you like to re-examine? Yeah, it, it just, just a small question to that, because I, I really would like to know if you see that, for example, your member state that you would see uh, Poland in the position to effectively safeguard the human rights of Polish citizens with regard to the national security activities by EU member states. So for example, looking at the GCHQ from the United Kingdom, um, acting, for example, vis-a-vis -vis Polish citizens, is there any safeguard given in Poland or do you think that the member states in the European Union can effectively enforce these safeguards or do you think uh, that this has to be debated on a European level, which I heard a bit when you were referring to the European elections, Having in mind to that, I'm asking in front of the background that this is an area which is excluded from EU competence. Okay, uh, okay. I, I will answer this question in a little bit different uh, uh, fashion. Because uh, one of our questions uh, which were presented to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs but were basically about uh, plans uh, regarding future of protection of privacy, but not even at the EU level, but in the global level. So, uh, so for example, we know that there was this suggestion by, uh, uh, this, by the Special Rapporteur on the Freedom of Expression, by the UN Special Rapporteur on the Freedom of Expression, that there is a need to prepare a new general comment and maybe a new protocol to the ICCPR regarding the protection of privacy. And so we asked the question to, to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, okay, so what is your position on this? Are you going to support it? Is this an issue which will be subject of, uh, of, uh, your, uh, of the position of the Polish government uh, in future? And, uh, and I would love that the Polish government will be the, one of the champions of, the, of, 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 of privacy in this, in this regard. As regards uh, safeguards right, right now, I think that... Uh, 
it's, it's, it's difficult to say because, you know, Polish law is, is quite complex and we have all the institutions, we have the prosecutor's office and we have all those uh, commissioners, but the question is whether they can really react to, to this in a situation when there is no political willingness to do anything serious with this, that there was no even investigation by the prosecutor's office uh, started. Uh, when we invited the representative of the prosecution uh, office, uh, he was not very much aware of what, what is the real consequence of, of, of PRISM and, and, and so on. So, so, uh, so it is the, the question of discrepancy between law, legal regulations and the existence of institutions and, uh, and uh, reality in this, in this regard. Thank you, Mr. Bodnar. Frau Ernst, next frage. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Ich möchte zunächst Ihnen erst einmal danken, dass Sie sich der Sache so annehmen, wie Sie das jetzt tun. Ich denke, dass das wirklich beispielhaft ist und wichtig ist, zu erfahren, dass das passiert und dass es möglichst in anderen Ländern auch geschehen soll. Ich finde es auch gut, wegen der unbeantworteten oder vermutet unbeantworteter Fragen auch vor Gericht zu ziehen. Das muss man, glaube ich, machen, sonst kommt man gar nicht weiter. Also das ist erstmal für mich total wichtig, dass das geschieht und das unterstützen wir. Und ich will auch ehrlich sagen, wir sind Ihnen da auch wirklich dankbar, weil wir das hier brauchen, hier in diesem Ausschuss. Das war die Vorbemerkung. Jetzt meine Fragen. Also in vielen Ländern sind es Journalisten gewesen, die im Besonderen die Diskussion vorangetrieben haben. Und da meine ich nicht nur den Guardian und den Spiegel oder Le Monde, sondern auch andere Medien und zwar aus einer konkreten Bedrohung, die auch ähm, diesen Berufsstand angeht, nämlich die Frage, inwieweit man denn wirklich Quellenschutz gewähren kann. Äh, das, diese Frage haben viele gestellt, viele Journalisten stellen sie sich und deswegen frage ich, in den polnischen Medien gibt es eine solche Debatte darum, dass man sich um solche Fragen sorgt und dass es deswegen wichtig ist, das Thema auch zu setzen in den Medien, die ja eine ganz entscheidende Bedeutung haben der Frage. Das zweite Punkt ist die leidige nationale Sicherheit. Wir können auf europäischer Ebene dort nur bedingt etwas tun, weil das im nationalen Kompetenzbereich ist, wie wir wissen. Ja, aber auch dort ist es dann so, dass man auch nicht zu den Antworten kommt und die nationale Sicherheit gewissermaßen wie ein, ein, wie ein Schwert vor einem ist, das dann zuschlägt und jede Frage nicht beantwortet. Wo, wo sehen Sie einen Ansatz? Haben Sie Diskussionen in Polen über solche Fragen wie nationale Sicherheit? Was ist das? Und äh, wie viele wie viel Möglichkeiten einer wahrheitsgemäßen Beantwortung von Fragen im Zusammenhang mit solchen äh, Dingen äh, muss es geben und gibt es äh, momentan? Also das bewegt mich sehr, weil wir, glaube ich, in all den Fragen überhaupt nicht weiterkommen, wenn wir nicht äh, den, mit dem Begriff nationale Sicherheit noch einmal äh, exakter umgehen. Das Dritte, ich habe den Eindruck, dass eine Kontrolle der Geheimdienste in Polen genauso wenig stattfindet wie in den allermeisten anderen europäischen Ländern oder nur peripher oder nur ein bisschen oder gar nicht. Es ist eigentlich das Quantum und die Qualität schon fast egal benannt. Ich glaube, es ist ein großes Leck äh, in der europäischen Debatte. Und meine Frage ist, was wäre für Sie ganz entscheidend, um auch nur im Ansatz Sicherheits-, also Geheimdienste kontrollierbar zu machen. Wir wissen, das wird nie komplett sein, aber was ist für Sie wichtig? Sie haben eines genannt, das ist die externe unabhängige Kontrolle. Das reicht, glaube ich, noch nicht. Vielleicht können Sie dazu noch mal etwas genaueres sagen. Und das Letzte, ich bitte die Vertreter des Rates und der Kommission auch noch mal wirklich dringend eine ganz klare Antwort zu dem 7. Oktober zu geben. Ich betone das noch einmal, dass wir das exakt haben wollen, was exakt dort stattgefunden hat und will das auch noch einmal begründen. Wenn Sie es nicht tun, muss man Sie der, ich sag mal so, bewussten Irreführung aller Außenstehenden verdächtigen und das muss ja vielleicht nicht sein. Ein Stück weit Wahrheit und Ehrlichkeit, glaube ich, gehört ja auch zum Geschäft. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, the issue of uh, journalistic freedom and freedom of expression is a subject of, of discussion in Poland. Uh, I remember 
two years ago when uh, there was a, a disclosure made uh, that, 11, uh, that uh, telephone data, uh, billing information uh, of 11 journalists have been checked by the Central Anti-Corruption Office. So they immediately thereafter, they've organized a big press conference saying that th there is no agreement to this. And, uh, but I would say uh, that Polish journalists are more concerned about themselves and about their specific cases, some specific investigations they do, then they are so much concerned about the state of affairs in the whole world. So, so for example, I don't even remember any serious comment regarding to the recent reaction of the UK government to, to Guardian and, uh, and to the letter which was signed by numerous NGOs regarding, regarding this. Maybe it was mentioned somewhere in the foreign affairs section, but it was not subject of, of, a, general, uh, of a general public uh, discussion. Uh, so, and when it comes to, to government, uh, it, uh, you can see such a huge discrepancy in, um, in, and hypocrisy, I would say, even in some activities, because on the one hand, the official policy of the Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs is, is so safety of journalists. And we even we had a conference organized together with OSCE, uh, Office, uh, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, on safety of journalists, which taken place uh, in, in Warsaw. But, but when it comes to real cases, like the Garden case, uh, you cannot expect any, uh, any diplomatic reaction by Polish uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but also you cannot expect a reaction by Polish journalistic uh, societies uh, in terms of this. By virtue of legal provisions, we have pretty good protection uh, of journalistic uh, sources. So, for example, you know, I know journalists who are dealing with the CIA rendition case, and they were never compelled by use of some uh, forcible measures, I would say, to disclose their, secret, uh, their sources of information. So they can operate uh, somehow, and we, and we have quite good tradition and, and, and a couple of good investigative journalists. And, and the level of legal protection is pretty uh, good, but it does not translate into the solidarity with colleagues from um, UK, for example. Um, with respect to national security, uh, this argument, uh, I would like to give you an, an, this example of a, of a litigation we had concerning access to wiretapping, uh, access to statistical information on wiretapping. When we started the case and we said that it is one of the measures of control to get the statistical data on wiretapping, uh, Secret services said, no, it endangers national security. It, it will create a threat to Poland and so, and so on. But over years, we won the case. They give us everything, you know, all the statistical information, and somehow nothing has happened. The, the national security, uh, uh, to a certain extent, as I understand, is, is protected. So, so I think it is the matter of, of trying to overcome this language, uh, showing that Okay, so, so show us real arguments here. Don't use this, as you said, this general argument, but please try to, uh, to, to show the, the specific uh, information. And uh, with respect to monitoring secret services, I think one of the issues which sometimes escapes in the, in the discussions on secret services is that in such countries like Poland, uh, secret services are still bureaucratic. It means that they have to produce papers. So every officer has to prepare a motion, uh, um, a specific note that certain actions have been taken or not. And a potential threat of criminal or disciplinary responsibility for abusing individual powers is one of the best methods to, 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 to control. One, one of the methods, of course, it is not the, the paramount method, but the, they should be aware that if they overstep competences, uh, if they overstep laws, they might be subject of some uh, legal action individually. And it, it is one of the issues which is sometimes, in my opinion, forgotten in the context of talking uh, about secret services. Thank you. Now we can be opening floor for further discussion for the members. As I understand, Mr. Kikov is also shadow, but he's not here. He's not here. So we move on to the rest of the members willing to contribute. 
I only let you notice that we are coming close to the scheduled end of this session, which should be by 9 p.m., so bear it in mind so that questions and answers should be smoother and quicker than before. The first floor goes to Mrs. Morvai. Thank you very much, and thank you for the interesting presentation and the paper. I'm a bit puzzled and a bit sad by the title of the paper, which is Poland's totalitarian history means its people except, except surveillance, and this meets Edward Snowden's disclosures more than they should. Don't you think, as a Polish person, that it's a bit uh, unfairly humiliating uh, towards uh, the Polish people who were fighting so hard during history for freedom. I'm also East European, I'm from Hungary, and I don't think that we accept surveillance uh, and uh, we, we had a totalitarian history because we love it. Uh, we were under Soviet occupation and when we tried to revolt against it, we were facing Soviet tanks. Um, I think uh, it could be just as fairly said as a title, Europe's totalitarian history means its people accept surveillance and dismiss Edward Snowden's disclosures more than they should. It's just as fair or even more fair to say so. Uh, and my other question is, um, when the so-called democratic transition took place in our countries, uh, in Hungary as well as in Poland, all these Westerners uh, came to us and were tutoring us and mentoring us on uh, democracy, the rule of law, human rights. And now it turns out that it was all a kind of a lie. I mean, the United States uh, had been surveilling its people and they send uh, political prisoners uh, into secret CIA prisons into your country and several European countries. They use drones to uh, extrajudicially kill people. You know, the, uh, uh, Western Europe does very similar things. If you make an analysis, uh, a kind of a socio-legal analysis of your own country, of your own people, uh, wouldn't it be interesting to, to do the same about the effect of this uh, kind of shock on East European people? You know, we were told that there is a free uh, word out there, and now it turns out that it was all a lie, and those who came to our countries and and were uh, treating us as second-class citizens and sort of tutoring us on, you guys, you have no idea about what is democracy and human rights, but we shall teach you. And who are the teachers? What kind of effect did this revelation have on the freedom-loving Polish people? Thank you. Okay, now we're going to make a block with the rest of the members willing to make points or questions. Please try to concentrate on questions. This is a hearing after all. Now we move on to Mr. Bronx. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. I'd like to go a little bit beyond your presentation. Uh, when the heads of the three security bodies in the UK uh, gave evidence before uh, a parliamentary committee, uh, they implied that Edward Snowden and the other whistleblowers uh, had revealed methods that would allow terrorists to avoid surveillance. Now, I haven't attended all the hearings that we've had in Lee Bay, but I've attended two of the longer ones. And my experience from the NSA representatives and MI5 representatives is that they didn't reveal surveillance methods, but they revealed mainly the range of people who were subject to surveillance, which was quite an, quite an eye-opener in view of the fact that it included government ministers. Is that your experience of the uh, whistleblower's information? It appears to me that the security services are trying to discredit whistleblowers by describing those people who are either wittingly or unwittingly uh, helping terrorists. Have you found you or any of your colleagues being subjected to the same innuendo? Thank you. Now, Mr. Boris Zewczowski. Thank you, Mr. Przewodniczący. I would like to thank my colleague, Mr. Morvaj, for za jej głos, bo rzeczywiście to byłoby bardzo fałszywe wrażenie, gdyby, gdyby uznać, że polskie społeczeństwo jest w jakiś sposób 
poprzez okres totalitaryzmów, pod, pod którego władzą się znajdowaliśmy przez kilkadziesiąt lat, polskie społeczeństwo było jakoś bardziej, mniej demokratyczne i dawało większe przyzwolenie na praktyki z totalitaryzmu rodem. Nic takiego w polskim społeczeństwie nie ma. Te kilkadziesiąt lat totalitaryzmu, w którym polskie społeczeństwo żyło, nie tylko nie oduczyło nas demokracji, ale wyzwoliło jeszcze większą potrzebę demokracji w polskim społeczeństwie. Bardzo dziękuję, że, że pani to dostrzegła. I wspomnę już w ogóle tradycje demokratyczne w Polsce sprzed z, z wielu wieków, wtedy kiedy w większości Europy były monarchie absolutne, Polacy wybierali no, w demokratycznym wyborze, w demokratycznym tylko dla tej szlacheckiej części społeczeństwa, ale jednak król, władca był wybierany w tym czasie. Więc to absolutnie nie ma takiego problemu e, społecznego. Polskie społeczeństwo jest bardzo wrażliwe, Polacy są bardzo wrażliwi na e, demokratyzm rządów, na przestrzeganie praw człowieka, na przestrzeganie zasad prawa i to jest e, poza wszelkim sporem. Mamy problemy rzeczywiście. Ja jestem przedstawicielem partii opozycyjnej, więc nie będę tutaj występował w roli adwokata polskich władz, e, ale chcę powiedzieć, że na przykład praktyki związane z e, instalowaniem podsłuchów, e, korzystaniem z bilingów były w ostatnim okresie przedmiotem bardzo drobiazgowej kontroli e, prowadzonej przez Najwyższą Izbę Kontroli, organ kontroli państwowej w Polsce, który przedstawił bardzo obszerny raport, szeroko dyskutowany w Polsce, wy, wykazujący błędy w działalności różnych instytucji państwowych w zakresie e, korzystania z tych technik operacyjnych, między innymi podsłuchów. Bardzo precyzyjne wnioski zostały przedstawione. Mam nadzieję, że te nieprawidłowości, które były, będą poprawiane. E, oczywiście musimy o tym dyskutować. Ta sytuacja związana z, z PRISM, z, ze sprawą Snowdena i to jest po prostu, no, trochę zaskoczyły te wydarzenia. Chyba nie byliśmy wszyscy na to przygotowani. Stąd y, są problemy również w Polsce. Ale na pewno nie można tego odczytywać jako jakikolwiek problem y, związany z, z podejściem polskiego społeczeństwa, które jest nie mniej demokratyczne niż jakiekolwiek inne społeczeństwo w krajach członkowskich Unii Europejskiej. To nie jest problem społeczny, to jest problem funkcjonowania różnych instytucji państwowych i w takim kontekście proszę tylko patrzeć na ten problem. Dziękuję bardzo. Dziękuję, Mr. Wojciechowski. Now it's up to you. It's your turn, Mr. Bodnar, to summarize your conclusions, considering that we should be Finishing by 9 p.m. Please help us out with the timing. The floor is yours. Okay. Uh, first of all, I, I will answer this, this question whether uh, NGOs dealing with those issues uh, are subject of some, some threats or some, uh, some denominations in the, in the public uh, sphere. I would say that in this context of PRISM, there was no discussion whatsoever regarding this. Uh, but I remember that in the context of, the, uh, of dealing with the CIA rendition case, you know, there were such arguments uh, that we are helping to bring terrorists to make another attack and it will happen in Poland uh, in a way. But, but it was just, I would say, um, publicistic, uh, just a general talking, nothing, uh, I would say, very, very specific or nothing individually directed. So, uh, so uh, mm, I think Polish example in this regard is, is not, not so uh, compelling. Uh, with respect to this discussion on, on Polish tradition of, uh, of freedom, I, I perfectly uh, agree with Mr. Uh, Mr. Wojciechowski that, that we have uh, great traditions dating back to 16th century or even earlier regarding uh, this. And, uh, and I agree that, uh, that Poland is a, and Polish people are people loving democracy and human rights, but I think it does not necessarily translate into proper sensitiveness towards uh, such issues like, like privacy. Uh, I think that with this we have still uh, a work to do and it is work to be done by NGOs, by politicians to make people more aware of, their, um, of the need to protect their, uh, their privacy. And, uh, and I can just repeat what I've said before, that in this particular PRISM case, 
there was no proper reaction by politicians because there was no uh, pressure by the Polish society in order to explain those, uh, those issues. And we have written this article with Mrs. Uh, Kasia Szymilewicz being uh, rather surprised that because of this tradition of, uh, uh, of massive surveillance in the communist times, there is no su sufficient support for explaining such issues right now. That was, that was our argument in this, in this article. This title, which is here, which I think it was given by, uh, by, by Guardian, and it was not, not our, our title, but our argument was that especially in such countries, we should be more aware of, uh, of those problems that relate to the protection of, uh, of privacy, that we should not forget the, the tragic uh, past before 1989. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bodnar, for your fair comments. I think it is honest enough. It's fair enough to thank you, to appreciate your effort to summarize in this final round of answers. Just let me tell you, we will be proceeding with our work in the Live Inquiry December the 2nd, 3 p.m. onwards in Brussels, and we will be having the presentation of the working document on democratic oversight of intelligence services by our colleagues, Mr. Moraes, Mrs. Infeld, and Mrs. Ernst as rapporteurs. We will be having that presentation December the 5th. So if that's agreed, we thank you. We thank you all. That'll be it by now. Thank you. Second December, December the 2nd, 3 p.m. in Brussels. We will be continuing our work, receiving our work in the Lib Inquiry. Thank you all. And also, and also December the 5th, we will be having another a, a, a follow-up session to, to hear the presentation of the draft report I just mentioned by our colleagues, rapporteurs and shadow rapporteurs. December 2nd and December 5th, is that clear? Three o'clock, three o'clock. Thank you. You have finished the committee? I have just came after the...